Okay, um, so today, well, my name is Chris Kolhoff, I'm the author of the Boost ASIO library, and it's a... <laughs> <laughs> and for anyone who's been wondering, that's how you pronounce it, ASIO, so you can, I don't want to hear any other pronunciation while I'm here. <laughs> um, and if you're wondering where that pronunciation comes from and where the name comes from, it is actually the name of the, uh, the basically secret police sort of equivalent in uh, in Australia. Um, well, yeah, we we sort of we we like to take the Mickey out of things. So um, now <laughs> I'm going to start off by saying what this talk's not about. If you're looking for an introduction, um, the door's back there. Uh, no, just kidding. What? <laughs> I'm not actually going to be going through here are the basic steps to write a program. What I'm going to be talking about are some of the basic concepts, the fundamental concepts that go into the library and some of my thinking that went behind the design. And what I'm trying to get across here today are those ideas so that when you come to design your programs, you can use those ideas to inform your design. Um, one of the key design criteria I had when I started out doing ASIO many years ago was that it shouldn't be a framework. I wanted to avoid frameworks and take what I call a toolkit sort of approach. And the way I define a framework versus a toolkit is a framework is somewhere to hang your hat. It's, it's a skeleton and you just need to add in your code at the appropriate places. Whereas a toolkit to me is more a collection of functions, classes that you can reuse in whatever way you see fit. And in fact, that, that's the case with ASIO. There's no, there's no one right way. I'm not going to tell you that you must design your program a certain way. I'm going to make some recommendations today, but you're free not to follow them. Um, but hopefully by learning about the, the fundamental design and uh, concepts that make up ASIO, you will be able to use it um, in whatever way is appropriate to your particular problem. So I suppose I'd, I'd like to start off by giving you some background to what was going through my brain uh, when I came up with the ideas behind ASIO. And we're talking uh, you know, a long time ago when men were men and <laughs> 2003. <laughs> <laughs> and. Oh, hang on. You're good. You're good. Okay. Uh, at that time, so I'd been doing various network programs and I'd been using more framework oriented kinds of libraries. And so, and these things were often based around design patterns and you may, if you've worked in this space before, use design patterns like Reactor, Proactor, Active Object. Uh, I'm not going to go and explain what all these are, but these are the things that are going through my head. And there were two other things that happened to come together at the same time. And one was that I was working with a colleague who was really into this stuff and he was all about making the proactive design pattern, which is a design pattern for developing scalable network applications, about making it work in terms of Reactor. So he was, uh, he wanted to allow the proactive design pattern to work on as many platforms as possible. Historically, Proactor was aimed only at platforms that had native asynchronous I.O. Uh, but for him this was not satisfactory. So he went out and developed his own implementation that used uh, whatever facilities were available for networking on the operating system to implement Proactor so that he could write his programs once and have them compile everywhere. Around about, I mean, he would tell me about this every lunchtime. So we'd go out for lunch and this is what I'd hear about every day. <laughs> Around this time was when I first discovered Boost and the first libraries that I got into were Bind and Function and for me this was a revelation. Uh, discovering that you could use, I already knew about function objects, but discovering that you could adapt function objects, arbitrarily add and drop arguments, 
uh, it was a whole new world that opened up to me. And these three ideas, the design patterns, this portable proactor and uh, bind and function, they came together and I thought, hey, we don't have to use a framework to do this proactive stuff. We can just go and make everything a callback function object. So rather than having programs inherit from an a abstract base class and override you know, the handle read, handle write functions, they could just go and adapt any function object they wanted to use as a callback for the completion. And so if I actually worked it out, I could probably figure out the exact date when I had this, uh, this idea because we it, w it was the evening after we'd had a little users group sort of meeting in Sydney for people who were doing similar sort of work. And so I went home and I just hacked this up and originally everything was a boost function um, that would get passed in and it worked. I mean, initially I was implementing using, if people who know select as the function to target all the operating systems that I wanted. But from there it sort of grew and I added backends for um, the different operating systems to try and optimize performance. Um, and I guess, you know, fast forward a few years into Boost and the review process was also uh, an important point in focusing the original ideas to try and extract the um, more generic abstractions while still avoiding the framework approach. Okay, so that's, that's where I'm coming from here. And I guess that, yeah, that's a long way of saying that I'm not going to dictate, you know, if somebody sends me a program and says, I want to do it this way, I'm not going to say you're wrong unless there is an obvious problem with the program itself. And actually, I'm going to highlight some of the more common problems that people have in the talk today. But first, I'd like to uh, start off... Oops with the basics of any asynchronous program that uses ASIO. There are four main components that make up any program. Oops. The first one is this on a, the first one is the I.O. service. And the I.O. service, if you like, you should think of it as your channel to the operating system. It is your communications between your program and the operating system which is performing the I.O. on your behalf. Now, I'm not going to, it, it would be ridiculous if every single I.O. that you want to perform had to be submitted through the I.O. service, so over the top we have these things that I call I.O. objects and they provide the um, object-oriented sort of layer to submit the I.O. request. So in this case, the example is a TCP socket. And so the things you can do with the TCP socket are initiate a read operation, a write, connect, and that sort of thing. And the I.O. object will go and take that and via the I.O. service submit that operation to the operating system. The next thing, and this is, you're not going to just have one of these, and that's an asynchronous operation, a typical application is going to be made up of many, many of them. And I'm going to talk about these in detail in a moment. And the final component is a call to I.O. service run. And that is where you actually give the I.O. service the opportunity to go and execute the work for you on your behalf, run the callbacks, and so on. Okay, so what, what, what does an asynchronous operation actually consist of? Well, first of all, it has to have an I.O. object because, as I said, that's how you submit your, your requests to the operating system. It then has something that I call the initiating function. And that is the particular class of operation that you want to submit, whether that's read or write or whatever. In this case, I'm given the example of connect. Then you have the arguments that the I.O. object will package up for you and pass to the operating system. So in the case of a connect, it's the, it's the endpoint identifying the remote server. In case of a read, it would be some buffers that you want it to fill. And the final thing is the completion handler, and that's the callback function object that you would like to be called when the operation completes. 
Now, every completion handler in ASIO has a signature, and in the case of Connect, it's just a, um, a single function that takes, so it takes a single argument of a boost error code, of a system error code. Um, in fact, all of the function objects, um, well, sorry, almost all of them take as their first argument an error code, which in indicates not only whether or not the operation w was successful, but also, if it wasn't, the nature of the error. Now, some of the operations take additional arguments to their completion handler. So for um, a read or write, for example, it's the number of bytes that were transferred. And if you look up the documentation for any particular function, you'll, you'll see the signature that you're supposed to provide. Now, what happens when you make this call? Well, the first thing is that your I.O. object goes to the I.O. service and says, hey, I've got something for you to do. The I.O. service then communicates with the operating system and creates the work item within the, the operating system space. Now, I'm just going to, a little digression here. When I say operating system, I'm using the term as a logical term rather than saying that this is actually happening inside the kernel because some of these operations are actually emulated in user space for you by ASIO. But from the point of view of your program, you should just think of this logical space as the operating system. And I'll come in a moment tell you why this is, it's important that you should think this way. Okay, so it goes and creates the work and inside the work item, it, it's storing the handler, which is the completion handler to be called when the operation finishes. You then, in your program, you make your call to IO service run. Time passes. Then the operating system says, hey, IO service, some work is finished, come and get it. And the IO service goes and dequeues that work item out of the operating system and into user space. And as it does that, it gathers the result of the operation, which, as we saw, is like error code plus bytes transferred or whatever. Then your IO service makes the call to invoke the completion handler. And so in this case, it just calls the function passing the error code with the result. So that, that's that, in, in a nutshell, is what happens when you make a call to run an asynchronous operation. But a real program doesn't just have one operation outstanding. It has many, you'll have many I.O. objects and many operations outstanding in the operating system at any one time. So you can sort of think of a program as if it's been running for a while. It's going to look something like this with many objects sitting in the operating system. And your program will be calling IO service run waiting for something to complete. When that happens, the IO service will dequeue that one completed operation into user space. And as we saw before, we'll call the handler. Now, you might be thinking at this point, well, hang on, what happens if it finishes up and dequeues everything out of the operating system? What then? Well, in most ASIO programs, you will take the opportunity when you dequeue a work item to initiate another asynchronous operation. So in the case of after you've connected your socket, the first thing you might want to do is initiate a read. And that goes back around in the loop back to the IO servers and submits a new piece of work into the operating system. And so your program will continually be regenerating pieces of work and that keeps your program running. Once all of the complete pieces of work in the operating system finish, then only will your I.O. service run finish. Uh, yes? So if you have these multiple I.O. objects, can they all use the same I.O. service or do you have multiple I.O. services for each? All right, so the question is, uh, do you have a separate I.O. service per I.O. object? And the answer is no, you usually, uh, well, by default I should say you should just have one I.O. service object. Uh, in more complicated designs, then you can have uh, more than one if you choose. But generally, yes, you will share the one I.O. service between many I.O. objects. Can you call run on 
the IO service instance more than once? Uh, so the question, can you call run more than once on an IO service? And yes, and that is one way of introducing threading into a design, you'd call it. So, well, it depends what you're asking. If you're talking about having multiple threads call run, that is one way. You can also uh, serially call run. If you run out of operating system work, you can reset the IO service and, and use it again for another call. Um, so that when I say... Um, I don't want to dictate design. That is one perfectly valid design option for a program is to have a program that's just a sequential um, call, set of calls to run where you just run a limited number of asynchronous operations at any one time but then go back to doing something else in your, um, in your application in the meantime. So, yes? So, <coughs> excuse me. When you call run, it immediately returned? Or does it pause until all of the work handlers have, or the work items have been completed? Okay, so the question is does run immediately return? Or um, The answer is uh, yes, it waits until all the work items have completed by default, but you can explicitly stop it if you so choose and leave the work items pending in the operating system and come back and call run later to collect them. If, if you want to do that. So while you do need to call run for the operations to finish, you don't have to call run at any given time while, while there are outstanding operations. So yes, Dave. So if you're doing that, I, I think what I'm understanding is that all of your own code, including callbacks, ends up, end up running synchronously in the sense of there, there's no concurrency and unless you explicitly... So, yes, the, so Dave's saying that um, the callbacks run synchronously from the point of view of the application in that you have complete control over when your callbacks are called by making the call to run. And actually we'll see later that this is, this is key to managing concurrency in your application because there are times when you don't want callbacks. You want to control when stuff is happening in your code. Okay, so yes, and then uh, uh, we've already covered this. The I service run just keeps going until um, all the operations have either been collected from the operating system or it's explicitly stopped. Now, you can just toss all that away now. Uh, <laughs> well, you, no, you should, you should keep the, that fundamental um, operation in the back of your head, but in general, when you're writing an application, there's a simpler model that you can use and that is just to think in terms of asynchronous operations and their completion handlers only. And forget about all this communicating with the operating system and that sort of thing. Because when you think of your application in these terms, you can start modelling it as a chain of operations. And so here I've got a very simple example where um, it starts off by initiating an asynchronous connect operation on a socket. When that completes, if there was no error, it initiates an asynchronous read. When that completes, an asynchronous write. When that completes, an asynchronous read. And round and round and so on until an error occurs. Now, if you, if you start modelling your applications this way, well, then you can start drawing your protocol diagrams basically like this. And I've actually got some tools coming up for Boost 147 that actually make it easy to see what is going on inside a running program in much the same way. Okay, so given that, what are the, sorry, yes? So on that, actually, is it, is it not the case that really you could define it in terms of a standard state machine? Um, or is there something different about what you're... It's a, it's a little bit different because the states, if you like, are actually the red lines. They're not the, the handlers. I mean, you, yes, you can. You can write programs as a state machine and as you transition into an asynchronous operation you would put your state machine into um, that particular state and when that operation completes you would compute. I was just thinking yeah. of it from a design perspective. And and that, that's a perfectly uh, valid way of designing a program. It's not the way I generally choose to use it though. Um, what The way I tend to write programs is more in this sense it's, it's almost like imperative programming it's just that things are strung out in a chain rather than happening in a 
a single block of code. Uh, yes, Dave. So uh, I've recently had the, the pleasure of doing some asynchronous programming in Python using Twisted. Yeah, I assume you're somewhat familiar with that architecture. It's a lot, has a lot in common. One of the things that I found uh, rather painful was that sometimes, you know, the ethos is you do everything asynchronously. Don't, don't make your program block for anything. Mm -hmm. um, but I found that sometimes there's a, there's a, a sequence of things that you want to do or some, or some like something that you could write easily as an imperative function with control structures with a bunch of places where it's going to, where it has to do these asynchronous things and, if, and breaking it all up into separate callback functions is, is tedious at best. Yes, and, and yes. Around. Okay, so Dave's comment, yes, is that the spaghetti code you end up with can be a bit tedious and error prone. Do you have a strategy for... Uh, I do, and if you come to my awesomeness talk, you'll get to see it. Your awesomeness <laughs> talk? <laughs> no, I mean, there, it's not actually just about uh, what you can do in C++ OX. I'm actually a reasonable proponent of using coroutines to manage this sort of stuff, but I tend to prefer, and I will talk about this in my other talk, um, stackless rather than stackful coroutines for people who are familiar with the term, just because in, in massively scalable programs it gives you much more control of the memory usage and, and so on. Okay, so all right, given that, what are the, the key challenges that I see if you're designing asynchronous programs using ASIO? Well, the first one, the most fundamental I think, is managing your object lifetimes, because you now, you're not dealing with a synchronous sequence of calls where you're just using objects that are on the stack, you now have to deal with the fact that um, you will be exiting scopes while objects are still in use. Uh, the next thing is how, how to think asynchronously when you're uh, designing your programs, and particularly the, the common pitfalls you might fall into if you not you haven't quite got the right mindset. Then I'm going to talk about how how I see best to use threads in conjunction with ASIO, and finally, how to manage complexity in a growing program. Okay, so object lifetimes. So if we just, if we just take a set of common asynchronous operations, we've got our I.O. objects, we've got our arguments, we've got our completion handler. Now what, what are the rules that ASIO may, guarantees for your program when it comes to these participants in asynchronous operations? Okay, well the first thing is that where ASIO declares the function to take the argument by value, ASIO says, I will take a copy of that argument for you and you can just let that one die, I don't care. And I will keep that copy for you until the asynchronous operation completes makes a similar guarantee for the case when the arguments are passed by const reference. Um, and usually the distinction between the two um, is I, I usually take the handlers by value simply because I want to document the fact that it can call um, the non-const function call operator if you like. Uh, in 1.47, if you're using C++ OX, I've actually started using taking handlers by our value reference, but same guarantee will apply um, that in that case, it's going to make a copy of the object and, and maintain it for the lifetime of the operation. But it's not going to make a copy of the buffer. When it's okay, this is not a... No. Um, okay, that's true, right? In the case of... Buffers, the buffers are, buffer objects in ASIO are shallow. Um, they don't own the memory associated with them. So it makes a copy of the buffer object. It is your responsibility in the application to guarantee that the lifetime is maintained un until the operation finishes. So you're just pushing the problem one level. Yes, yes, right. Uh, because the buffer objects are actually templated arguments though, you can, if you want, roll your own buffer objects that do reference counting or like so in some other way do the lifetime management for you. Uh, but the ones that ASIO provides by default do not do that. 
So why wouldn't you just pass by value in C++ OX? Uh, I might leave the answer to that for... Well, the question is, why wouldn't I just use by value and by R value reference? Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that in the other talk. Or Okay. I don't want to. I don't want to give away too many spoilers. Otherwise, I have nothing to talk about. <laughs> I, I didn't realize that was all other topics. topics. Yeah. Um, actually, most of what I'm copying in this talk is all valid C plus plus O three. I'm not really going to talk about anything C plus plus O X specific in here because I don't know about you, but in practice, everything I'm doing is uh, still I think it's GCC four point one. So I've I've got no alternative. So one last question from from the point of view of the client of your library. Are const reference arguments and value arguments the same? Yes, that's right. And I think the standard says similar things for many things. It says that the stand, the implementer of the library can choose. Oh, I can't remember. I think I read that somewhere. But I, and I don't remember the yeah. status. So, yes. Please repeat the question. Ah. <laughs> the the question was Sorry. from the point of view of clients of this library, are const reference arguments and value arguments the same. Yeah, so are, are const reference and by value arguments treated the same for the purposes of using the library? And the answer is yes. Okay, then we have arguments that are taken by non-const reference. So they're output arguments for the asynchronous operation and they, in this case, you as the, app, as the user have to guarantee that they remain valid uh, for the lifetime of the operation. And finally, we have the, the I.O. object. In this case is when the I.O. object is passed as the this pointer for the operation. Now, okay, as a general rule, I would say you and your application should guarantee the object remains valid for the lifetime. But, but, in certain cases, ASIO will say, well, if the object is destroyed while doing the operation, it will just cancel the operation for you. But in general, you shouldn't rely on that uh, in your applications unless you are only using the lowest level um, operations within ASIO. Uh, I'll, I'll come to that later when I start talking about how to manage complexity. Okay, so question for the audience here. What's wrong with this code? Does anyone want to make a... Yeah. The actual buffer data is going to ask Okay, so the answer, yes, that's right. The, the buffer data, which is the message object, is going out of scope. And this seems to be a common uh, newbie error. Now, we, we did cover this already. It is the application's responsibility to guarantee the buffer remains valid. Um, if you do make this error and you're using a compiler which has iterated debugging, I think... Uh, recent Visual Studios and GCCs, you'll get an assertion because ASIO will capture an iterator into the string object for you and then test it at the end of the operation to see that it's still valid. Okay, so what... That's a runtime? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's, sorry, yes. Was the problem that, that the buffer is going out of scope before IO service run is called? Uh, okay, so the question is, is the problem that the buffer is going out of scope before I service run is called? Um, it, no, it's more, it's more than that. It's that it's going out of scope. When you initiate an asynchronous operation using async write, there's no, it's, it's completely asynchronous. There's no guarantee when the actual I.O. will occur. Um, it may occur within the call to async write. It may not occur until you call... Um, IO service run, it may occur at any point in between. So I think what he said is correct on that basis. Uh, it, for, if what you're saying, if what you're saying is that it's guaranteed to complete by the time the next IO service runs. No, no, it's not, no, it's sorry. Be done from a handler, yeah, run what I mean another, right. the IO service already running. Uh, oh. No, it's, it's not that, it's not that the call to IO service run occurs is that the actual completion handler for the operation goes. Because just because you call IO service run doesn't mean the actual operation has completed. You may call IO service run and then explicitly interrupt it for whatever reason and the operation is still pending. You still have to guarantee the buffer at that point. All right, because, because these operations occur... Okay, this, this is why I drew the operating system as a cloud. 
you should think of the operating system as a context where stuff occurs um, asynchronously to your program. So once you submit something into the operating system, you don't really know when the operation itself is going to occur. And you should not try to rely on any knowledge about ASIO internals um, about when it actually does occur. Nor the order, if you have multiple items. That, that's right. You should not, you should not what, make any assumptions about the order in which things occur. So is it true that, that <coughs> even, even if you're not saying explicitly you know, uh, return right away when you call run, that it might not complete all of the I.O. that's currently pending before it returns? Uh, sorry, I got a bit confused will, in the question. Will I.O. service run always complete all of the pending I.O.? Okay, will, will I.O. service run always complete the pending I.O.? Yes, if you don't explicitly stop it. Or, sorry, there's two ways in which you can stop otherwise. One is you explicitly stop. One is that an exception escapes from a handler. Um, in both cases, you can then go and restart the run um, if you need to keep going. Cool. Yep. So basically, the only time that we can release the buffer is when our handler is called. The only time uh, we can release the buffer is when the handler is called. In general, yes. In practice, if you use um, custom buffer objects, because I said the buffer objects are template parameters, ASIO actually makes a slightly different guarantee that it will keep a copy of your buffer object until it no longer needs it. So if you reference count your buffer object somehow, then that, that is enough. You can, it will go out, like the memory will be released um, automatically at that point. If you're using the shallow buffer objects that ASIO provides, then you should keep it around until the handler is called. Yep. Yep. Is it the case that, uh, um, that multiple operations can be called in any order, even if you're using a strand? Uh, okay. Uh, maybe we'll come back. Sorry, the question is relating to strands. I'm going to talk about threads later, so we'll come back to that. Okay, so how, how should we deal with managing lifetime of the objects? Um, so well, let's just go back to our example of this simple use case where we've got a connect followed by a loop of operations doing read and write. The first strategy you can use is just to make sure that your object outlives any call to IO service run. And in very simple programs, this is probably a good approach to use. And actually in some complex ones too, we'll, we'll see at the end. So really all this is saying, because I guarantee that I'm only going to be calling your completion handlers inside IO service run, provided you don't call run afterwards, everything's sweet. Okay? But you know, in general, you're not gonna be just you're not gonna have an application which just has one connection object. You're gonna have an application which has a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand. Okay, so before I get on to the um, the next strategy is another question for the audience. When does object lifetime begin and end? According to the standard. <laughs> <laughs> begins when the constructor ends and ends when the destructor begins. That's right. So the answer is begins when the constructor ends and ends when the destructor begins. So what's wrong with this code? Anyone want to make a guess? Let's see. Socket's gone by the time you're starting uh, the connection. It's not, no, it's not so much the socket's gone. The socket object as a, as a member is still valid. The problem is that you, you may have left it till the destructor with some asynchronous operation still pending. And so you have things that may still be accessing your connection object by the time you arrive at the destructor. So if, if we say that we're in a case where we're running these connection objects uh, okay, in practice, it's not gonna, you're not going to experience that usually as a problem because people all the time, they spawn threads inside constructors. And, but um, as a general rule, if you see this in ASIO code where you are trying to cancel your asynchronous operations by closing a socket in a destructor, you're too late. By the time you reach the destructor, um, your objects that you've bound into your completion handlers and so on are no longer alive according to the standard. I think, it, I think what's missing for me in understanding this is 
what role connection is actually playing. Okay, so you haven't said how that sorry, into the rest of the system. Um, each of sorry, each of these here, uh, the member functions say of the connection object. Um, so that each piece of code in the box is inside a member function that's been bound up using boost bind to use as a completion handler. Okay. Okay. So if you still have these outstanding handlers associated with outstanding operations, by the time, whoops, which way am I going here? Uh, by the time you reach the the, cons the destructor, you probably have something wrong in your program. Okay. So this is a warning sign. So how should you? deal with this. Now the, the strategy I recommend using by default will, will derive from first principles if you like. So the first thing is to note we have a chain of operations here and the chain continues for as long as the connection object has something to do. So first thing to remember is that we want to keep the connection object alive for as long as the chain of operations continues. <coughs> The next thing is to go back to my original explanation of how asynchronous operations work is that for each asynchronous operation the operating system is storing a copy of the handler for us. And it will store that copy of the handler for us until the operation completes. And the final piece of the puzzle is that I said that ASIO will take these by value arguments and store them for you. So we put that all together and the default strategy that I recommend is to use shared pointer and enable shared from this. So what you do is inside every asynchronous operation when you start it into your completion handler function object you bind a shared from this. And so that, has anybody uh, not used enable shared from this before? Um, Okay, uh, doesn't matter, I'll, I'll explain it. I've got, I've got confirmation I need to explain enable shared from this. Can you help with that explanation? Uh, I, I might do. Um, okay, so shared pointer, as I hope most of us know, is a reference counted pointer. And sometimes you will be in a circumstance where you need to convert from the raw this pointer of an object into a shared pointer. Now the default thing you might try which is to construct a new shared pointer from the naked this pointer does the wrong thing um, which is it will create a new reference counting context and you'll now have two reference counting contexts going against the same uh, object which is bad things are going to happen. So what you need is a way to be able to create to obtain a valid shared pointer for the original uh, reference counting context associated with it. And so enable shared from this does that for you. It's, um, you inherit from it and it gives you a function, it's a, it's a member function of enable shared from this called shared from this which returns you um, a valid shared pointer for that object. So once, so Provided you start with having a shared pointer pointing to connection object. That's right. So when you first create your uh, connection object, you should pop it into a shared pointer somehow. And then from then on, whenever you want to use it in some lifetime extending way, like putting it into an asynchronous operation, you should always use the, the shared pointer rather than the, the naked pointer. Because if you, if you don't, then it might disappear while the operation is still pending. Uh, is that clear enough? So, so these handlers that you are using are actually more like function objects or closures because that they have data with them. They that's, that's that, to yes, they are, they are function objects. In fact, um, you, it'd be a very rare case when you would actually use a uh, standalone free C style function as a completion handler you will almost always be using um, something like boost bind or rolling your own uh, function object or lambda in C++ or X or something. Okay, so then the next question becomes how should you correctly, you know, if you want 
to get rid of your connection object, what do you need to do? So let's say in this case you're going through and I don't know, expiring all dead connection objects or you want to disconnect anybody you've used a thread or I don't know. How do you explicitly close that? And what, so what you should do in your object is you should create a function, I'm calling it stop, that in this case closes the socket. And what closing the socket does is it cancels all outstanding operations. Now they may not finish straight away but it, it asks the operating system to terminate them and then at some point in the near future they will all complete and your object will now have the opportunity to, uh, to clean up. Is there some, there's some subtle reason why you named it stop as opposed to close? Uh, no, you can name it whatever you like. <laughs> uh, except that in my case I like to call the, the, the counterpart on the construction side um, start. Because uh, the way I like to think of it is that you're starting off a chain of asynchronous operations and then the other end you are stopping the chain of asynchronous operations. And that's because of the, the thinking of, of, all the, of all the completion handlers additionally calling more function objects that create that chain. Uh, so you're yes, so starting think something as opposed to just simply having a connection that does nothing on its own. Yes, so you're saying basically yes, because you're thinking of it in terms of chains of operations that... Okay. Yes. So, so what does close... Oh, sorry. Sorry, oh, I thought I was paraphrasing the question. Sorry. Um, uh, was, was that a fair sum of, summary of your question? Yeah. Um, okay, so... So when does close socket close return? When when, when all okay. the jobs are cancelled or no? Or uh, when does when does socket close return? It returns immediately. It it, it is like a one-way message passing so communication. You know when you can actually delete the connection. That when do you know when to delete? That's what the shared pointer is for. Because your uh, all your operations will complete, and your uh, at some point afterwards. Oh. Okay and. Because the shared pointers are uh, keeping your object alive, that is the opportunity for them all to disappear. Um, that assumes that the connection object is always on the heap. It assumes the connection object is always on the heap, yes. And in, in general, um, in a complicated program, it probably will be. Like if, you, if it's a single client where you only have one connection, then you can probably take the approach which I had earlier, we just put it on the stack. But uh, most of the programming I do is all server side, and we're talking hundreds or thousands of connections. So. Um, now, once you've got this, now that we have in the standard, I think recent versions of Boost, we have Make Shared to create a shared pointer. I like this as a nice little way to kick something off for a connection. Um, it's just to use Make Shared to create the connection object, and then in a single line, start it. Now you don't, you don't need to collect the return value of make shared because what you're actually doing in the start call is you're sort of pulling the, the lifetime ownership of the object down into the operation which you're, you're kicking off at that point. Okay, so the next set of challenges I think uh, go through how to think asynchronously in, in your designs. So I'm going to go back to this problem that I put up before. What, what is wrong with this code? We've sort of touched on this already. The second part is that the socket close call returns immediately. It's just a request to the operating system to close the socket and cancel the operations. So even if this worked for in the other case, which it doesn't, uh, you're going to exit from your destructor before the operations complete. In fact, if you were doing this from inside the IS service run call, it is guaranteed that is going to be the case because the next completion handler can't be called until you return control back into IS service run. So what should you... Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, slight digression. Um, this is sort of based on some real production code that I've seen. What's wrong with this code? Doesn't use date time. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't, doesn't use date time. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to pay that one, Jeff. <laughs> or chrono, yeah. 
x times zero. Well, there, there's obviously no error checking, right? So we well, there's two different. <coughs> it's not initialized. There's two different time calls. Yeah, the time Dave's, Dave's correct. It, it's making two calls to obtain the time. Okay, and we'll, we'll, it, it was a merge error that this, this happened. <laughs> and, and I'm sure we've seen those sort of things before. Um, they're supposed to be populating the structure with the, the time in seconds and the time in microseconds, but it's obtaining that, those time values through two different calls and so the bug that we'd see would mysteriously time would jump forwards to 1.9999 or when and then backwards again um, and that's because it was reading the time at, at two different in times so this is why I say you should think of the asynchronous sorry think of the operating system cloud as this asynchronous blob where stuff happens asynchronously to your program. So in this case, time keeps moving forward. I, mean, I know, know that sounds a bit, bit stupid to say it, but you can't make an assumption that when you make two consecutive calls to obtain the system time that you're going to get the same value because chances are it w the, the computer's system clock will have moved forward in the meantime. Almost guaranteed. Almost guaranteed, but not entirely guaranteed because the clocks are usually updated uh, on an interrupt and so it's possible that if your code executes fast enough everything will be, you'll get the same value. So in a similar vein, what's wrong with this code? Socket could be disconnected. Yeah, yeah so th that's right, the answer is socket could be disconnected in the meantime. It's a race condition. In fact, it's, it's the same principle as the previous example of the time. The state of the socket is stored in the operating system and it can change state asynchronously to your program so that even though your program is single threaded, you're like single threaded, I'm not going to have any race conditions. Um, you, th that is not true, you're dealing with objects outside of your program that will change state asynchronously to your program. So the key I guess to thinking asynchronously is to start um, assuming that almost everything around you can change state when it's not under your control. And so conversely though, if you're going to design programs that actually work, you need to identify the parts of your program that are under your control and that will only change state when um, will only change state when you make them change state. And so that you know that they're not going to sort of switch values in between things. So in the case of our connection object, um, the thing that is under our control is the whether or not the socket is open. Now this is different to whether or not the socket is connected or whether it's disconnected by the remote peer or whatever. The socket being open is, is a state within your program, which is the file descriptor or socket handle or whatever, that you have not yet closed. And when you call stop, that's the only time when you were changing state from uh, open to closed. So what I recommend then is when you are writing so um, your programs to shut down cleanly, you have to deal with the fact that uh, you had your outstanding asynchronous write operation or read or whatever, you called stop on your object to in turn close the socket and try and shut everything down. But it actually what happened was that the operating system had already finished your write successfully. So the state of your write operation changed asynchronously to your program from being unfinished to finished. So you can't rely actually on the, I know I've left it off in this slide, the error code um, indicating that the operation was cancelled by closing the socket because it may not have been cancelled due to this race condition. The state that you do have control of though is is the socket open or closed so you should actually check if, if you are going to allow your, your um, objects to be explicitly stopped in this way you should check some internal state of the object in each completion handler to determine whether or not it was in fact stopped. So the final piece that I recommend if you're going to design your programs in this way using enable shift from this is that you also provide 
this is stopped um, as a helper function. And so when you, like this, this is the general pattern that I sort of recommend that you follow by default. Um, that you derive your objects from enable shared from this and provide the three functions start, stop, and is stopped. Um, okay, so, so we're doing on time. Um, the next section I want to just talk about briefly is how to manage threads. And I like to think of it as there's a spectrum of different approaches you can take. And so I'd start from the top, the ones that I'd recommend you use most. And as we move down, you should be using them more rarely, but they're still there if you need to use them. Okay, so the first one, obviously, and this, in the same way as the standard, I think, recommends using standard vector as the default container of choice, I'm going to recommend that unless you have some good reason otherwise, single threaded should be the default threading model of choice. Because once you introduce threads, then you have to start worrying about synchronization and that sort of thing. But there's not much more to say on that, so um, what I'm going to talk about next actually is how to use threads uh, for long running tasks within an ASIO so that you don't, so you can execute the task without holding up the main thread of control of your application. And then I'm going to move on to um, a couple of approaches which probably better utilize multiple cores, multiple CPUs in a, if that's appropriate for your uh, application. Okay, so yeah, as I said, single threaded, default starting point, um, but the key though is you need to keep your completion handlers short and they, you don't block the work in them for any particular length of time because if you block the work, then no other completion handlers are going to be able to run. But let's say you do have some work that will execute for a particular length of time, so I don't know, communicating with a database or something. How should you integrate that? Well, what I recommend is that you, you keep most of your logic in the main thread. So primarily your application is still single threaded, but you have a background thread to perform the long running work and when the work completes, uh, work, the result is passed back for execution on the, the main single thread um, to continue the processing. So, how does that need to work? So if we go back to our, our basics, you've got the operating system context with the outstanding work. In this case, we have some long-running asynchronous operation, pseudo-asynchronous operation, that we want to run uh, in our own application. So the first thing is to start a thread or use an existing thread and po put the work item into the context of that thread. And then the thread goes off and performs the database operation or whatever and in the meantime your application is calling IO service run to collect results of operations. On the main thread. On the main thread, yes. At some point when the operation completes the thread posts the result and the handler that's associated with the operation into the operating system context and immediately the operating system notifies the IO service which dequeues the handler and the result back into user space where it can con call the handler to run the, op the com completion handler. So it's very similar to what the operating system is doing for you for uh, I.O. operations, it's just that you are performing the operation in a background thread yourself and then posting the result back through the I.O. service. So, <coughs> so is there a mechanism by which in the completion handler I can tell the run process which is executing the queue, right, which is looking at all the work uh, objects in the operating system, not to stop. Okay, well, there's only one. Oh, okay. Well. That, your question is exactly what I'm about to talk about on this slide. Um, yes. So, sorry. The question is, how how do you make sure the I service run doesn't stop while you're doing this work on the thread? And 
there was a good reason why in each of these little work items I had this uh, um, work written there because in ASIO terms work is an object of this type and what, what this object does is it tells the I/O service you've still got something pending you've still got some work that hasn't yet finished and when this work object is destroyed then the I/O service can check has it run out of work or does it still have more things to do and keep going and so on All right now in in the operations that are implemented in the operating system there isn't a real object of type I/O service work it's just logically you can think of it that there is one but in your own programs if you want to provide the same behavior then you should use one of these so if you wanted to implement this long-running operation in the background thread in the connection object we had then so the first thing is you need you need something to kick off the request to the background thread to do the work and in this case so I'm using a hypothetical function async which is not hypothetical I think if you're using C++ or X um, to execute something in a, in a different thread and we're creating a function object here we're passing in a bunch of arguments which represent the work to be done but we're also binding in one of these objects of type IO service work to keep the IO service thinking that there's still a pending operation then some point later in the in the background thread the do work function executes and this is where you do whatever it is and when it finishes then you call IO service post to post the result back into the main back to the IO service so that it can run in the main thread and when that when that argument work goes out of scope that's that's where the that's how the IO service knows that the last bit of work is done that's right and in, well in fact the post call creates if we go back here when you post you're actually creating another bit of work within the operation so that still keeps it alive so the chain of work continues there's no other way so yes. this is the same as you're essentially creating a given loop, right? Yes. Um, so if you can, the only thing that's different from a, what I think of as a traditional living loop then is uh, is to uh, is to deterministically order uh, the events in your event, event list. Uh, okay. So sorry. Yes. The question is basically like an event loop, and yes, that's what ASIO is internally, but you're saying that the main difference well, this is what, what I would call is the imperative style rather than well it's also proactive versus reactor for people who knows those terms so um, reactor tends to mean more it's event driven when stuff occurs you will take appropriate action whereas proactor the asynchronous model is you initiate the operation and when it's done then you in the chain take the the next action, but internally, yes, it's all managed as an event loop. <coughs> okay, and then yes, so then so the final piece is just it's it's no different really to any of the completion handlers for um, asynchronous operations. You, is your function that gets called when the operation's finished? Now, just sort of if if you don't have access to some sort of async function already to run stuff on uh, a background thread you can in fact use a second IO service object in your application to do the same thing so you just need to run an IO service in a background thread uh, and you can post work post a completion handler into the background IO service it will run it and then uh, when the long running task finishes it posts another handler back into the main thread Okay, so the next um, approach you might want to use is to use multiple IO services, but one thread each. And in this case, th you would tend to use this if you have a design where you've, it can be partitioned cleanly. Like there's a, a lot of objects that don't necessarily need to communicate, they don't have any shared state or not much shared state. 
And so you can load balance them across uh, a pool of I.O. services. There is an HTTP server example in ASIO that does this. Um, you still need to keep your handlers short and non-blocking as in the single threaded case because if you don't you'll be holding up um, other handlers running on the same I.O. service. And in general I say you should ensure your objects because you don't necessarily know the home I.O. service of any particular object and you don't know if it's going to be running in the same thread as you or as a, in a different thread as you, you should use a message passing approach if you need to communicate between objects. And to do that sort of message passing, uh, the design I recommend is that you, um, you make your actual uh, implementation functions private, in this case I've got do foobar as an example, and your public functions simply post um, a function object into the, the home IO service and that, that ensures that the object uh, so the, the function runs in the correct thread context of that particular object. Now IO service post um, is perhaps less efficient if you're making calls between objects that actually do reside on the same thread so you can also use IO service dispatch which will um, it's like a fast path if the object is running, if, uh, if you call IO service dispatch from within an IO service run for the same IO service object, then it just calls the, the function object directly. It doesn't need to do any enqueuing through the operating system. Okay. Sorry, yes, we've got a question. The dispatch was doing two things. Was it doing what the previous call did if the post? Does it do a post if it's not within? So, yeah, the, yes, the question is, does dispatch do a post if you're not in the correct thread context? Then yes, it does. So you can always just use dispatch? You, you could always just use dispatch if you want, yes. Uh, sometimes, though, you may want to guarantee that the function object will not be called um, recursively. And so you, in that case, you will want to use post because that guarantees it will just be enqueued for later rather than execute immediately. So it's up, up to the use case which is more appropriate. So I actually have a use... Oh, Sorry. Go on. I actually have a use case. <clears throat> I have multiple pieces. I want to just initialize all of the pieces to start loading. At some time, asynchronous. And then I just want to let them run and, and then my program is going to continue on user is going to interact. And all of a sudden the user says, I want to use that object. It's still un still loading. And I want to say now, wait till that object completes loading. So you gave that example where you had IO service run in a long running thread. How do I tell IO service run not to stop if there's no work handler? And how do I tell a connection to complete without, in, uh, what I really want to do is at this point in time where I absolutely have to have the contents to say, okay, you're synchronous now, essentially. Um, okay, so the question is how, there's two parts, I guess. First is how do you tell the I service that it needs to wait, uh, even though it may not have yeah, any, yep. and, the, and the second is that so you've got this long running loading process, you've got objects waiting on the loading and you want them to start doing stuff um, when the loading completes. Okay, so the f answer to the first part uh, I had in this example here, you can just use a... Oh, I missed it. You can just use a work object. So in this case I'm using one to keep the background thread oh. ISIS alive, right? Oh, I see. Okay. Right, so you can just use a work object, that will just keep it running as long as necessary. You can explicitly destroy your work object if you need to shut it down at any point. Okay, um, but okay, you could, in relation to your loading part, you could use two-step, if you want to do things synchronously, then you could run your iService once to do all your loading, but not kick off any of the other objects operations and then when your IO service exits because it's run out of work, you kick everything else off and then just run the IO service again for everybody well, it's else. Not, it's not that simple. I have, say, 150 objects and I'm loading. And I'm just using one of them. So. 
I mean, just one of them has to be finished at this time because that's the one I'm now using, and the rest of them needs to just continue. Okay. Yeah. What What I would actually recommend, though, in most programs, is that you use or abuse, if you like, a timer, um, deadline timer class in ASIO, because what you can do is you can set a timer with an infinite expiry, because the date time classes have positive infinity as an expiry time. And so you actually set a timer with a positive infinity and anybody that's waiting for this object to finish uh, loading just goes and waits on the timer. And they're, wait so they're, they're performing an asynchronous wait against a timer that uh, notionally will never expire, but when the loading does actually finish, it just changes the timer to expire at negative infinity instead and suddenly everything that's waiting is released and anything that doesn't um, due to uh, their own loading taking longer doesn't actually start waiting on the timer until after object A has finished loading will immediately, their wait will complete immediately because the timer is now set to negative infinity. I mean, if you like later, I can illustrate yeah, with an example, yeah. but... Uh, yeah. The blank look on my face. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, uh, th there are ways to do it, and you don't need to treat things synchronously. I would generally prefer to keep... I mean, you're saying you've got other operations running which are asynchronous still in, in conjunction with this, so you don't really want to divide half your program into um, synchronous and asynchronous. You'd like to trigger off certain events, have other events start... Like when the the loading finishes, that is an event, right? Offline. Yep. Okay, so then. Uh, so Chris, one more question yeah. here. So you propose the use of the deadline timer as a a lock on an on a server. It's more okay. Proposing deadline timer as a lock, it's actually more like a, an asynchronous condition variable. A condition yeah. variable, right? So. Um, is this so? As soon as you talk about condition variables, then you start thinking about okay, there are a whole bunch of locking primitives uh, that you normally are used to when you're doing training. So this is new to me. So I'm asking you: Is there do you have this documented somewhere as to the kind of locks that you can? Perform? Well, um, all of this works just perfectly fine in a single-threaded program. So it's not locking as such. Uh, the, some of the, yeah, some of the examples do illustrate this usage. So, uh, so because I don't, I prefer not to dictate designs, the use of deadline timer is only one way to do it. You can also do it by storing objects like your, can, the next piece of work in boost function objects or whatever. It's just, it's just one particular way I like to use. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, yes, multiple IS services, uh, it's fairly similar um, to the using, sorry, uh, one I/O service, multiple threads. Yes, fairly similar to multiple I/O services, um, except that this time you need to deal with the fact that your handlers can be called from any thread that you call I/O service run. So you now have the issue of some of the logic in your class may execute concurrently. Um, so for that, ASIO provides an object called a strand, which I'm going to cover in a moment. But similarly to the previous design approach, all objects really should communicate by a message passing anyway. But this time, it's because of the strands. Okay, so a strand, at a high level, you should just think of it, it, it just means that a set of handlers that don't execute concurrently. And they, a strand can be implicit. So if you just run one I/O service from one thread, so your entire program is single-threaded, then I call that an implicit strand because it's implied that your handlers will not execute concurrently. Uh, another example of an implicit strand is when you just have a single chain of asynchronous operations, you never have more than one outstanding asynchronous operation at a time, and so once again um, you cannot have the logic execute concurrently. But, of course, in any complex application, you're going to be running multiple asynchronous operations simultaneously, and so you do need to deal with the fact that your completion handlers could run on any thread. And so that, um, so okay, so the, yeah, sorry, this is the example. If you could have 
Each one of these is a single chain, but because they're all separate objects, uh, the separate objects can execute on different threads, so the load will be spread across multiple CPUs, but any given object, only one handler can run at a time. Now, um, sorry, there's, there's something in the way that you're talking about this that I, that I, I leave, there's a, there's a gap for me. You, you talk about, you talk about objects as though they have a particular relationship to IO services, I think. In other words, you made this <coughs> you made this framework where you do everything in terms of functions, great, and then and then you say, but often you're going to do this binding, and then whenever you talk about, you know, you're going to bind objects into these into into these uh, function things that are you know are just just like boost function, and and then when you talk about objects, it sounds like there's some assumption that each one is only associated with one I.O. service? Okay, so just like trying that? to paraphrase, am I making an assumption that each object is only associated with one I.O. service? Uh, in this design approach that I'm presenting in this talk, where you use enable shared from this and so on, then yes, I say generally you would be, because you're, so in the case of the connection object, your connection has a socket. It might have two sockets, which we'll see in a moment. It might have some timers and whatever. I would recommend that all of the I.O. objects can, associated with that connection do run on the same I.O. service. Yes? I don't need, part of my conceptual problem is that I don't even know what you, what, what do you mean by a connection? I mean, what are you, what are you trying to group together in that object? Uh, the, the, what is meant by a connection, um, in this case, protocol logic. It, it, is the, it is all of the logic, all of the buffers, all of the state necessary to manage that particular um, connection or whatever it is. So if it's a, um, a mail server, it's going to include your user ID, your, uh, the home folders. So it's all of, all of the state necessary to manage that particular um, remote connection that you're, you've accepted from somebody. Does that, does that help? I think so. Um. So, well, although AZ only provides the low level IO building blocks for doing XYZ, um, in a real application you're going to have um, things to parse messages, you're going to have a, a message format, you're going to have all these things. They all have their own state that needs to be kept in the application. AZ won't do that bit for you. Right. Uh, and so, Yes, as a general design rule, you should group those together in, in this design approach into a single object where anything within it uses the same IO service so you can manage the concurrency and only manipulate that state from one thread at a time. Okay, so, so yep. Okay, uh, since you have this picture on the screen, uh, um, so th this this would be like uh, a synchronous way of thinking. You do this, and then you go into a loop, and right. Yep. And then when you go to asynchronous, you you get the inversion of control because you you write these handlers, and you suddenly deal with with multiple handlers. Are you also undoing the inversion of control? Uh, am I undoing the inversion of control? Yes, in a way. I mean, in this code, it's still inverted in the sense of your execution returns from the function um, and you have to wait for the event for execution to continue in another function. But in the way you think about and design your application, I recommend thinking about it as you being in control of the event. So you do a read and then you do a write and then you do a read rather than um, the completely inverted model which is Socket says I can do a read now, or Socket says I can do a write now, and taking uh, action in response to that event. So you are undoing inversion of control in your head? Yes. So how is this different then from the uh, full inversion of control? How is this different? Well, um, hopefully, because we are running short on time, in the last section um, we'll talk about how you can use this to create larger abstractions within your program. Which one of the the key problems I had with the re reactor pattern is that it was very difficult to create higher level abstractions on top um, 
in a way that they could be easily reused. So yeah, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, so just in terms of strands, you know, we had this previous example, very simple, only a single chain of operations, but let's say that our connection was actually a proxy, so it's communicating between two connections, two, a socket downstream and a socket upstream, um, then in this case it's going to be after the initial step of establishing connections, it's going to be running two little chains of operations in parallel this time. And it could be that if you've got multiple threads, then a handler for either one could run on uh, any thread at any time. So you say, okay, great, mutex, I'm going to use a mutex. Uh, and so you go through and you put a scoped lock into each handler to, to man manage your state. Um, problem with that is actually, um, oh, I think I've missed a step here. It violates the blocking rule. Yeah, well, it violates the blocking rule, that's right. So, because if you, it could be that the hand, the same, a handler for the same object is currently running on the other thread and the, so the mutex is already locked. Your handler is blocked and can't run until the other one finishes. So ideally what you want to do is actually not run the handler straight away but queue it for later when the lock becomes free. And that's actually what a strand does for you. So a strand says if it's uncontended I'm going to run the handler straight away. If it's contended I'm going to queue it for later. And to use a strand uh, in the connection object here, what you need to do is add an extra layer of wrapping around your function object for your completion handler. So all strand wrap does is create a, a slightly fatter function object that ensures that the internal function object only executes uh, one at a time for the given strand. So you would in this particular example, you'd probably have a separate strand object per connection because you're quite happy for different connections to execute concurrently, but you want to guarantee within that single connection object that uh, it's single threaded. Uh, if you're doing the message passing, it's very similar to what we saw before, except this time you're doing your post or your dispatch through the strand rather than through the IO service. Uh, it just guarantees that any again, that it will not execute more than one at a time within the strand. Okay, um, but yes, going back to the idea, well, why not still just use a mutex anyway? I'm quite happy to live with the, the blocking. Well, the problem is actually, if you can see the red, these functions here, these ones, async read sum, are the low-level operations on uh, the I.O. object itself. But async write is what I call a composed operation. So it's a higher level abstraction that is implemented in terms of lower level uh, uh, asynchronous operations. And so internally, it actually looks a little bit like this. When you go into this, you perform your uh, chain of async write sums. Now, you've got this problem here, you've got some state which is actually being accessed by these intermediate handlers here and you need to make sure that those intermediate handlers are also synchronized correctly for your object. Now a strand does that for you automatically, but what I'm going to show now is how you could actually do that for a mutex to give you an idea of how a strand works. Right? Um, so the idea here is you've got a mutex uh, that you want to associate with a given handler, um, this is just poor man's function call forwarding, and you want to wrap, in the similar ways we're calling strand.wrap, uh, we just want to create a new wrapper function object for any function object that we pass in. Now the key part is to use one of ASIO's um, customization points which is called an invocation hook. So every single completion handler that runs in ASIO runs through one of these. It's located using argument dependent lookup and it allows you to customize how handlers um, are executed or how function objects associated with handlers are executed. 
So what we're actually doing here is saying that for any, any function f um, which is associated with our mutex wrapper based handler, we just want to execute it within a scope block. And so this, this customization point means that every single intermediate handler in that composed operation is executed within the lock. And a strand does a similar thing for you to make sure that um, every uh, intermediate handler um, is executed only one, like does not execute concurrently. Um, okay, and yeah, so this is basically the same. Now, I've just got one more section to go. We're only a little bit over time here. Um, so what I want to talk about here is how to manage complexity in your application because as people have pointed out as protocols get more and more complex the chain gets longer and more complicated so what approaches can you use to manage that now there's two approaches that I recommend and the first one I'm calling pass the buck and the second one I'm calling the buck stops here and the principle of pass the buck can actually be divided, subdivided into functions and classes and I'm going to give a couple of examples. So if we go back to our pro proxy connection here, we've actually got two loops running in parallel. We can actually recognize but hey, these loops are actually um, basically doing the same thing. So they're a candidate for some piece of logic that can be abstracted out. So what, what I'm going to propose is that we're going to write what I call the pass the buck function to do that loop of operation. So I'm going to call it async transfer and what it does is it takes the two sockets that it's, it's linking, it takes a buffer to use as working space and the handler to call when the overall operation finishes. Now, and yes, as I also known as a composed operation, so things that are in ASIO right now like async write and async read are equivalent to what we're going to do here. Now, the reason it's past the buck, past the buck means past the buck on ownership, past the buck on threading, past the buck on just about everything. This function doesn't want to take responsibility for any of that. Okay, so it's up to the caller to guarantee the lifetime of the socket objects and up to the caller to guarantee the lifetime of the, the buffer and so on. So yes, our function is going to be performing this chain of operations and it's only going to be calling the completion handler if an error occurs. Now, I'll, I'll let you read this at your leisure if you've got a copy of the slides, but this could, one way of implementing the function is to do it as two separate completion handler type functions that represent the two uh, functions in this diagram here. So here I simply have a function called do read that initiates the asynchronous read. Chris, side. yep. I speak only for myself. What I need a break. Uh, well, we are nearly finished. It's so. yeah. over. It's going to so end right now. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and the the other half, of course, is the do write that initiates the do write operation. At the top, because we don't, we want to hide these implementation details from the user of our function, we simply provide the function with the signature that I proposed before and it initiates the whole chain by calling do read. Now another way of implementing it would be to do it as a state machine type approach where you're either doing a read or doing a write and for certain sorts of um, composed operation that's probably the, the right way to go about it. And the way you might implement that state machine is to do it using a function object rather than standalone functions and so you just store the state as members of your function object and in the the function call operator you simply do the thing if I'm doing the read we initiate the read otherwise we initiate the write and it just keeps calling back into this state machine at the completion of each uh, underlying operation. Uh, and again, to initiate the operation, we've got this, the high level, it's got exactly the same signature as the previous implementation, so the user of your uh, abstraction is unaware of how you've implemented it. Uh, and then the overall proxy class is simplified to just look like this. After the connection, it simply initiates the two 
async transfer calls to run the bulk of the work. Uh, now, passing the buck on threading means you need to implement one of these customization points because unlike the previous case where we were customizing it to do a scope lock on a mutex, in this case we're customizing it to pass the buck to the next guy up the chain. And th that's what pass the buck is all about, is deferring responsibility on how things are in invoked. And this, this makes sure that your abstraction works correctly with strands. If you, optionally, you might also use the customization points for allocation because ASIO will be allocating some objects behind you to do various bookkeeping. So if, if you want to, you can pass the buck and uh, transfer responsibility for allocating and freeing to the next handler in the chain. Um, if you wanted to, and I'll leave this as an exercise for the reader, or viewer, <laughs> audience, um, you, you could easily implement, you can recognize the fact that that async function uh, doesn't use anything that is specific to sockets. It just works in terms of stream type, ASIO stream type operations. So you can make your functions more generic as you see fit. And the operations in ASIO like async read and read until and so on operate at the stream level, not at the socket level. And, okay, so another way of doing it would be to recognize that um, not only do we have the, the chain of operations, there's also buffers associated with this operation. If you want to hide the existence of the buffers away, rather than writing a pass the buck function, you may choose to write a pass the buck class. The principle is basically the same, except that as data members of the class, you adding the additional state that you need to store uh, for the duration of the operation. Now, in this example, there's two buffers, one for the upstream side of the proxy and one for the downstream. But what I've done here is I've exposed the two operations, upstream and downstream, as public operations of the class. An alternative design, um, so it looks like that when you implement it, but alternative design would be to do it as a single async run operation and in this case the example the the fact that there are multiple uh, chains inside is hidden from the user in both cases it's the responsibility of the caller to uh, maintain lifetime of the object there's no lifetime management no enable shared from this in fact this class works equally well if you use enable shared from this or you store it on the stack or whatever you choose to do and again, if we implement our proxy, it, it looks like that. Now, so in that case, the operation inside that pass the buck class sort of looks a, a bit like this. So it sort of forks off, and then you've got two chains of operation that run on indefinitely, whereas the original case is more like there's two chains of operation that um, run side by side, and actually the caller is entirely aware of them. Now, I would actually argue in terms of pass the buck being the principle, um, that this is the approach you should use because you're passing the buck on the chains themselves further up um, the application. Okay, so the other approach is the buck stops here and actually it looks fairly familiar because it uses enable shared from this, it uses um, shared pointers. In this case, you're really implementing um, so let's skip through the equivalent of the top level class and it's I, I would say in a very in a fairly large application you will end up having multiple buck stops here abstractions communicating with each other in much the same way as um, if you're just writing the top level of the application so you can also provide uh, reusable components using the same approach that you would use in uh, just writing the application itself. So I'm sort of glossing over a few things here because we're short on time. Uh, but yeah, so the principle in any application, the buck's got to stop somewhere, right? So you should consider structuring your, your application in terms of passing the buck, and some of that buck passing will occur in ASIO, and some of that buck passing may occur in your own abstractions. But ultimately, at the top level, you've got something like the enable shared from this approach, which is
taking responsibility for threading and memory allocation and whatever else. Now, the, the great thing about when you put these two things together is that you don't have to use enable shared from this. I'm not saying you have to. If you can manage your object lifetimes at the top level of your application, it doesn't necessarily mean on the stack, it could just mean putting them into an SDL container or whatever, then you don't need to use shared from this, you don't need to use anything like that, and you're, um, so you're no longer paying the cost of reference counting. If you also customise the memory allocation, you can make use of the fact that you know how many chains there are going to be in your application up front to commit all of the memory that you need up front and recycle that memory. So you can end up using these two facts to put together an application that has no reference counting costs, all the memory is committed up front, and you have zero allocations in the steady state of your application, which can be important if you're doing low latency or embedded or whatever. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yes, yeah, just to summarise, uh, the four main challenges that we had, I proposed four guidelines. One is to know the object lifetime rules. So even if you choose not to use the shared pointer approach, pay attention to ownership and uh, how ASIO will copy objects for you to use that to your advantage. Um, secondly, in terms of thinking asynchronously, assume that most things will change under your feet, but at the same time you need to maintain, like keep track of the state that you know is under your control, because that's the key to writing a working application. Thirdly, as a general rule, prefer to keep your application single threaded, and even if you th really do need to use threads, try and do it in a way uh, that the majority of your logic will still be single threaded, because you don't have to deal with issues to do with synchronization. And finally, as a principle, if you want to manage complexity by writing abstractions of your own, try and employ the pass the buck principle as much as you can. So, yes, make it somebody else's problem. Okay, that's, that's it. Thank you.